The Riordans was the second Irish television drama serial made by Radio Telephus Ariane. It ran from 1965 to 1979, and was set in the fictional townland of Leestown in County Kilkenny. Its location filming with outside broadcast units, rather than using only TV studios, broke the mould of broadcasting in the soap opera genre, and inspired the creation of its British equivalent, Emmerdale Farm, now called Emmerdale, by Yorkshire Television in 1972. The show is considered to be something of a landmark and cultural influence. Issues such as conservative versus liberal, farming issues, poverty, illegitimacy, old age, marriage breakups, clash of religious and new liberal ideas, and most famously contraception were just some of those tackled on the show, and it was hugely popular throughout its 14 year run. The exact number of episodes produced is unclear, and the show ended with considerable surprise, and a lot of criticism, when the new director of programming at RTE, Muris McConghail, decided that the show had run its course and so axed it. Part of the justification was the cost. It was one of RTE's most expensive shows to make. With the launch of RTE 2 in 1978, the station believed that it needed to produce more shows for its limited budget as a small station, and it could not do that if the Riordans took up much of the budget. Critics, however, suggested that RTE had failed to market the show internationally and that, given the size of the Irish diaspora internationally, all interested in home, it could have had an international market among stations in countries with large Irish audiences, with its sale recouping much of the cost involved in its making. There were also allegations of cast mistreatment, and the change in theme music and removal of certain characters didn't help the criticism aimed at the show. A controversial policy of RTEs in the 1960s and 1970s led to the erasing of previous episodes of old programs, so that the expensive videotape that had been used to record them could be reused. As a result, little remains of RTE's 1960s output, with shows like The Reordans, The Late Late Show, and others routinely wiped after broadcast. However, some 1960s episodes remain, as do many from the 70s. As mentioned earlier, the exact number of episodes produced is difficult to say, so exactly how many are missing and how many are existing is, at least to me, unknown. Given RTE's history with archiving programs and the fact the show was a national soap opera made exclusively on tape with little to no overseas appeal, the existence of film copies is unlikely, and any episode of The Riordans or any other RTE show considered missing are most likely permanent lost. Now on one as a tribute to the late Joe Pilkington, the <laughs> producers of an episode of The Rear. Eamon the Rear will remember Eamon Marr. He was a young traveller who drifted in to Leestown in 1966 from the west with his, his young wife. Um, she wasn't very well. Was Jude by getting it. Come on, come on, come on. Tom, I, I can't go into Kilkenny dressed like this. We're not going to Kilkenny, we're going to Greg. And when you're going to a fair, you don't dress up as if you have money. Spider-Man vs. Craven the Hunter is a 1974 fan film produced by students at New York University. Directed by Bruce Cardozo, it was adapted from the comic book storyline of the same name from The Amazing Spider-Man No. 15 by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. The film was not an officially licensed Marvel production, but it did receive the unofficial blessing of Stan Lee before starting production, as well as his approval of the finished product. Cardozo had long been fascinated by the challenges of producing believable superhero films, and made several well-received amateur forays into the genre. Upon entering NYU in 1972, he proposed his latest idea as an experimental project for his film class. They would attempt to create a 16mm, full-colour, 30-minute Spider-Man movie, so faithful to both the character and the story, that audiences would feel as though they were looking at the comic book come to life. Many of his classmates were sceptical, but his instructor agreed to let the film shoot proceed, apparently having some faith in and admiration for the project. By all accounts, the production team took great care and showed incredible creativity in enacting Cardozo's vision on a shoestring budget. Pre-production reportedly extended over a year or more. After a long search, Joe Ellison was cast as Spidey's alter ego Peter Parker, with Richard Eberhardt playing him while in costume. Andrew Pastorio played Parker's boss, Daily Bugle editor J. Jonah Jameson. It is unknown who played Craven the Hunter or any other characters, as they are not credited in any surviving documentation. 
Rumor has it that the actors in the film all had prominent New Yorker accents. Another nod to authenticity, not always being present in bigger budget productions based on pre-existing work. Costumes were created by Daphne Stevens and Marilyn Hett, inspired by the iconic artwork of Spider-Man co-creator Steve Ditko. Graphics were designed by Richard Eberhardt and included such obscure details as the spider signal, a device that the webslinger used very early in his career to project his image as a warning, very similar to Batman. It was even nodded to in the Insomniac video game as being a completely implausible, mechanically flawed idea. The film also reportedly used innovative lighting effects created by Art Schweitzer and instead of using static backgrounds implemented many travelling matte shots of New York elements, including a neon lit Times Square to simulate the effect of Spider-Man swinging through the city. There were also large building sections built and laid horizontal to simulate Spider-Man climbing up walls. Throughout the production, Cardozo was greatly encouraged by ongoing, if still very unofficial, support from the Marvel Comics team, which ran a glowing profile of the project in their self-published Foom fanzine. This support evidently saw the film through to completion at least. The plot of the film directly adapted the one from the comic book storyline, although some changes were made. In the original, it begins with Spider-Man defeating a gang of thugs. One escapes and turns out to be the recurring villain Chameleon, who in turn calls on his half-brother, Craven the Hunter. This renowned warrior is intrigued by the idea of adding the notoriously elusive Spider-Man to his trophies and agrees to track him down. The hunt culminates in a final battle wherein Spider-Man must fight through numerous tricks and traps to decisively defeat Kraven in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The film's main changes involved the removal of Chameleon and added Peter Parker's girlfriend Gwen Stacy, who had since become a popular supporting character in the comics. The film's finale also seems to have added tigers to Kraven's arsenal although it is unknown how this was achieved on such a minimal budget. Initial plans were to distribute Spider-Man vs. Kraven the Hunter commercially, but at some point shortly after filming wrapped, Cardozo abandoned the idea, reportedly upon finding out that Lee and Co's support did not extend to basically giving away the rights to their most popular character. Evidently frustrated over having poured so much effort into a seemingly dead end, Cardozo lost interest in the project. Over the subsequent years, he was persuaded to hold screenings of the finished film only occasionally at comic book conventions, beginning with Marvel's second annual comics convention in 1976. The last known screening of the film took place at the Comic Book and Science Fiction Convention in Los Angeles in 2005, approximately 18 years ago. As the years passed, Cardozo and the original team who worked on the film continued to guard their creation closely, for reasons that became and still remain unclear. In 2004, Dan Paul, director of the 1992 fan project The Green Goblin's Last Stand, emailed Cardozo asking if he could have a copy of the earlier film. Cardozo refused to send a video file online out of fear that it would be leaked, but said he would happily screen it personally at his home in California if anyone desired. Cardozo would go on to make a pretty healthy living for himself with his work as a visual effects artist from 1980 until his death in 2015. Included on his resume are films such as The Avengers, Captain America The First Avenger, and uncredited work on Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. Despite renewed interest on the back of Spider-Man's greatest mainstream film success, this film remains lost, with only a few mostly behind-the-scenes screenshots still in circulation. Unlike many other unreleased fan productions, it has never surfaced as a bootleg at comic book conventions or online, and no one besides its creator has ever claimed to have a personal copy. Given that Cardozo's personal computer, believed to have held his only copy of the film, was reportedly destroyed after he died, and with so little information available on who else was involved in the project, it seems increasingly unlikely that it will ever be found making it permanently lost. BBC Television Service officially opened on the 2nd of November 1936. For its early years, the high-definition television service would be housed at Alexandra Palace, as its hilltop position made it effective in transmitting television across London and the surrounding counties. However, as the Second World War loomed, the BBC would officially cease all television transmissions on the 1st of September 1939, the very same date that Nazi Germany began its invasion of Poland. The rationale was that it would prevent the Germans from exploiting the transmission signals from the palace so they could use them as a navigational aid. The last coverage shown prior to close down was the Mickey Mouse cartoon, Mickey's Gala Premiere, which, although it was claimed to have ended abruptly mid-transmission, was known to have been fully run before television became inaccessible to the British public for almost seven years. 
While BBC television service would not fully resume until the 7th of June 1946, Alexandra Palace would be host to two private television demonstrations during wartime. The second of these, occurring in February 1945, is well documented thanks to the efforts of the BBC Written Archive Centre and the Alexandra Palace Television Society. It concerned a demonstration to the Commonwealth Broadcasting Conference, CBC, with the intention to showcase the Commonwealth members the programmes that were broadcast on the BBC television service in its early years. The transmissions lasted 40 minutes and were produced by programme organiser Cecil Madden at Studio A in the Palace with the delegates from the CBC viewing the footage from a closed circuit in Studio B. Based on the surviving photographs taken of the occasion, the demonstration began with commentators Freddie Grisewood and Jasmine Bly introducing actress Phyllis Calvert in front of the television camera. American singer and actress Evelyn Dahl then made an appearance, being joined by her accompanist Joan Bird. According to the documentation, Dahl earned five guineas, approximately five pounds and 25 pence, while Bird received approximately one pound and 80 pence, which was quite a lot of money at the time. The next appearance came from Canadian comedian Robert Goodyear. Following his appearance, segments from the 1937 television demonstration film were shown, showcasing Corky the Cockatoo with his keeper. The demonstration concluded with the play Julius Caesar, being performed by members of the BBC Drama Club, whose names were not listed in any surviving documentation. There was one other known wartime Alexandra Palace television broadcast, which occurred in August 1943. Unlike the highly documented February 1945 broadcast, little was known about the earlier demonstration, with no records of the display being available in the BBC Written Archive Centre or Public Records Office. Much of the information surrounding the broadcast comes from the notes of engineer Desmond Campbell and the documentation from Alexandra Palace Television Society archivist Simon Vaughan. The photos stored at the Alexandra Palace Television Society were dated as being taken in August 1943, and show that a Mr. Fuller and Mr. A.B. Howe were filming the scenes in the television studio. Two PDFs containing photographs from both demonstrations did exist online, but the 1943 one has been taken down. The engineers Wilfred Pafford and Douglas Brinkinshaw could be seen in two of the photographs, while others showcase a Mrs. Fuller giving a demonstration of a flower arrangement with presumably her daughter being seated in the studio. Mary Allen, the head of wardrobe and makeup, was also present in at least one photograph. Vaughan was able to validate the dates Desmond placed on the photos. Additionally, a uh, The Leader article from 11th of September 1943 was uncovered stating that BBC engineers were called to Alexandra Palace to conduct an important television picture for a private purpose. While this confirms that a broadcast was established in 1943, the transmission's purpose remains unclear. However, a few other articles, including from the Gloucestershire Echo from 13th of September 1943 and the Newcastle Evening Chronicle from the 1st of November 1943, a demonstration was called to investigate how to ensure pre-war television set owners were able to afford to have their own sets be updated, with plans to make some televisions cost only £20 following the war. Additionally, Vaughan met with Campbell's son Neil to discuss his father's account. According to Neil, he remembered that his father was called to an important meeting. On the way back, Desmond was involved in a car accident, which was why Neil remembered the occasion. Neil also claimed that the television demonstration may have also been showcased to either Winston Churchill or King George VI. Vaughan was also able to meet Pafford at his home. Information from Pafford was limited, as he became increasingly upset regarding what was being discussed, stating that he had signed the Official Secrets Act, and thus could not tell about the secret activities that occurred at Alexandra Palace during wartime. Pafford did state, however, that the RAF contingent and BBC staff situation at the palace did conduct closed-circuit demonstrations for one another throughout the war which could suggest further transmissions occurred prior to the end of the Second World War. Currently, Vaughan has been unable to further investigate the matter, as there is limited information on A.B. Howe, while all other sources have yielded no additional insights, and most of the people involved in these transmissions are now deceased. Like all early television transmissions, the entirety of both demonstrations were televised live, and there were limited viable means of recording television prior to the Second World War with recordings seldom having occurred until videotape was perfected in the late 1950s. Thus, all footage of the demonstrations is likely permanently missing, although the Corky the Cockatoo segment remains as part of the recovered 1937 television demonstration film, which still exists in its entirety, although in very low quality.
Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends is by now one of the world's most iconic and beloved children's TV shows. Originally adapted from the Reverend Wilbur Audrey and his son Christopher Audrey's Railway Series stories, the TV series began airing in 1984 and has continued in some form or another through to the 2020s. While this is certainly the most famous adaptation of the Audrey's anthropomorphic train lines, it is not the first having been preceded by a live BBC broadcast in 1953. The technical difficulties associated with this adaptation would prevent a full series from being commissioned for the intervening 30 years. In mid-1953, the BBC approached the Railway series editor Eric Marriott and inquired about the possibility of adapting at least two stories to television. Marriott and Rev Audrey approved the proposal on the condition that the adaptation be as faithful as possible, in particular to the authentic technical details. Details. Thus, the broadcast was to be done using specially modified 00 gouge Hornby models for the actual engines pictured in the books, with a track layout and painted backdrops likewise designed to ensure maximum faithfulness to the original illustrations. The script, however, was freely adapted. In order to fit the allotted 10 minutes time slot, it was to be broadcast live from Lime Grove Studios on Sunday, June the 14th, 1953. For his initial attempt, the BBC had chosen to adapt the sad story of Henry, a suitably dramatic tale of the titular engine being bricked up in a tunnel after he refuses to leave it for fear of rain spoiling his new paint. The live adaptation, now renamed to The Three Railway Engines, presumably for viewers unfamiliar with the books, had to be put together within a month, with the custom model train setup not arriving in the studio until the final rehearsals. Not ideal for what was already a notably complex production for the time, also including superimposed rain and other effects overlaid by music and narration by Julia Lang. On the day of the broadcast, the model movement was still said to be a bit jerky, but all started off well until one of the engines derailed, the train set operator having missed switching the points before the engine arrived at them. To the great surprise of viewers, including Marriott and Rev Audrey, a human hand picked up the errant engine and put it back on the rails instead. It was noted that narrator Lang struggled to improvise around the incident, but unfortunately her actual words are not recorded. The broadcast went on without further incident, but the derailment and its unexpected resolution attracted notice from several national newspapers. Rev Audrey is recorded therein as being disappointed with many aspects of the adaptation, including the script changes, which added characters that were not in his original story, the jerky model movement, and above all, the elementary mistake of the incorrectly set points. BBC controller of programmes Cecil McGiven evidently agreed with the criticisms, issuing a furious memo in which he called the whole effort pathetic. Audrey demanded guarantees that a similar blunder would not happen in the second broadcast, scheduled for June 28th. Instead, presumably thanks to the official scorn, it was put on hold and later cancelled. Although numerous attempts were made to revive the Railway series for television, all were unsuccessful until the current series began production three full decades later. As the show was broadcast live, and knowing the BBC's track record for preserving old content, let alone one with this kind of embarrassing technical issue, it can be safely considered completely lost. Any claims or clips to the contrary floating about online are either recreations or proven to be incorrect recollections. However, in more recent years, the BBC has developed a sense of humour about the incident. A brochure produced for their 100th anniversary highlighted numerous related documents preserved in their written archives, including the controller's memo, Audrey's letters, and at least one contemporary image, showing James's model sitting on the track layout. This is ironic, considering the character is the one Audrey objected to the most as being not in the original story. A higher quality version of this photograph, several letters relating to the programme directed to the BBC and Audrey, along with the pilot's camera script, would later be publicly displayed at the Tallylin Railway's third annual Audrey Extravaganza event on the 22nd of July 2023. The script confirms that elements of Edward's Day Out and Edward Gordon and Henry were implemented into the episode as a way of extending its length. Additionally, a first-hand account was provided by a volunteer at the Tallinn Railway who saw the episode as a child. With this, its legacy has been somewhat preserved, and despite being lost, it is far from forgotten. Written by Karel Kapek, R.U.R. is a science fiction drama play that served as a cautionary tale regarding humanity's growing obsession with mechanisation, which contributed to the production of various technological horrors during the First World War. In the play, 
Mr. Rossum and his nephew successfully invent a substance that enables them to create artificial life, the Roboti. However, whereas Mr. Rossum saw the project simply as means of verifying the existence of God, his nephew betrays him in favour of producing thousands of Roboti to serve industrial needs and in turn allow him to become rich. The Roboti are not exactly the same as the robots depicted in science fiction works or in real life. Rather, they are more akin to androids, for they are humanoid entities existing within artificial flesh. Comparisons between RUR and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein were made, including how both involve creating artificial life that later rebels against their masters. The play is split into three acts. RUR became a major success within its home country and across the world. Its concepts are therefore the basis for science fiction works like Blade Runner, The Matrix, and The Terminator, which primarily feature robots, artificial intelligence, and subsequent rebellions from the machines humanity has created. Therefore, it became a prime target for the BBC to air an adaptation for its fledging television service. On the 11th of February, 1938, the BBC televised a 35-minute abridged version of the play produced by Jan Bussell, featuring names such as Harvey Braben, William Lyon Brown, and Cherry Cottrell. Originally airing at 3.20pm, it was also repeated later that evening at 9.20pm. Prior to this, a trailer was aired live twice seven days prior to the broadcast, featuring the characters Domain, Helena and Radius. Additionally, the 14th of February 1938 issue of The Times agreed that the adaptation was a good choice for television, though, in also criticising the play it was based on, criticised the Adam and Eve scene for being misplaced in an otherwise brutal story. The robotics depicted in the adaptation also considerably deviated from the near-human appearances in the original play, resembling more so the traditional robot look featured in future science fiction shows. Other reviews focused on the show's special effects, a key component for later science fiction productions. Because of the limited range from the BBC's television transmitter housed at Alexandra Palace and the expense of early televisions, only a small audience within North London were actually able to watch it. While the 1938 television adaptation was initially largely forgotten, contemporary accounts such as from the Smithsonian Magazine indicate that it was historic for being the first ever science fiction television programme, in an experimental period for the BBC and drama television as a whole. Three years following the Second World War, another adaptation, this time a 90-minute production airing live once on the 4th of March 1948, was broadcast. Again produced by Bustle, the work somewhat suffered from a reduction in special effects and other limitations reflecting the BBC's desire to appeal to a more general, less intellectual viewing audience, as television slowly became more popular. Another key change was the robotics appearance. While a surviving photograph certainly reflected their near resemblance to humanity, most wore mere black loincloths and sandals to reflect the key importance of flesh within the play. Also of note was that Radius was portrayed by Patrick Troughton, the renowned character actor who would later star as the second Doctor in the BBC's biggest science fiction series, Doctor Who. Ultimately, the two adaptations were broadcast live in a period where television recordings seldom occurred until the advent of videotape recording in 1958. Therefore, no footage from either, nor the 1938's trailers, is believed to have been among the extremely limited surviving pre-Second World War BBC television coverage, or post-World War II television coverage. Nevertheless, photographs and Radio Times issues help to document them both. Written by Lewis Goodrich, Anne and Harold was originally a radio play consisting of six scenes broadcast on the 5th of March 1932. It detailed the couple meeting each other for the first time, before developing their romance and ultimately having a grand society wedding. The play was a success, and a sequel, more about Anne and Harold, was established in 1933 in an episodic serial form. Considering the popularity of Anne and Harold, BBC Television Service decided that the play would be ideal as an episodic television series. Again written by Goodrich, this version saw Anne Todd portrayed by Anne Teviot, with William Hutchinson portraying Harold Warden. Goodrich, an actor himself, also appeared in the show. Five episodes, ranging from 15 to 20 minutes in length, would be broadcast from the 12th of July to the 9th of August 1938. Plans for a sixth episode were ultimately scrapped upon Todd receiving a part in a West End play and being granted permission to leave the show early. Hence, the show ended with the couple appearing at Lord's Cricket Ground. Aside from being deemed the first ever episodic television series, Anne and Harold also received its own theme tune, one of the first of its kind. Ultimately, all episodes of Anne and Harold were broadcast live and not recorded. 
Therefore, all five episodes are now permanently missing. No audio recordings of the performance's theme tune are known to exist either. Two photographs of the show, and a Radio Times issue summarising the final episode, are all that remain of the series.